Thanks very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I would like to speak a little bit about small flying robots and I will touch on one side on the design of such small UAVs or MAVs and also on the visual navigation part. So we started with flying actually quite a while ago, about 2002, because we realized that with small wheeled robots, we are limited in, in uh, difficult situations where we cannot go over obstacles. So actually the first uh, flying robot we had was this Quadrator, which probably was the first one which was even also able to um, uh, avoid collision. This is Samir, who is uh, the inventor of the system, who is also then approaching it and uh, uh, then avoiding it. So quadrator is somewhat uh, difficult to control because you have to have fast controller, high dynamics. So the next step we try to start, think about something more simple so that you can scale it even down. This was our coaxial work, which uh, was a little bit later then. And you can see here, this one is, um, i show it again. This one is actually not controlled in XY. It's somewhat automatically stabilized in the air. So if there is not a lot of wind, this system can be very stable and very uh, inherently stable, but still they have, don't have so much dynamics. And you all know that today we can have this quadrator high dynamics. And I want only to show one of these videos from Vijay Kumar so that you can even uh, fly trajectories which actually would not be uh, able if you don't use really the whole dynamics of the system. Um, so you know that you can not stay in the air like this with a quadrator, but you can actually fly through a window in, in such situations. So what does it mean? I think today we have very good systems. We have the hardware which allows us to do different uh, maneuvers, uh, very high dynamic motion in the air. And uh, we have also perception systems and the ways how to localize, for example, to really fly um, in the air without even GPS. This is a somewhat recent result, a little bit more than one year ago, of a European project, um, so called S-Fly, where the intention was to fly with vision only, vision combined with IMU, with the air vehicle and actually only with one single camera. And this is the final results. You can see that this helicopter flying around in a somewhat the, um, test ground for disaster recovery and uh, search and rescuing. The view is a little bit limited, but... And so what we are doing here is tracking features in the environment. You can see here the features based on the feature doing um, explore, uh, um, finding then bring these key frames together so you have some of the local map and based on this map you can have a very precise estimation. What is specific also about this is that it's uh, very robust uh, against tail changes so you can fly up from one meter up to about 70 meters and you can still track the features. It actually is, has a single Sing camera looking downward and you can actually do localization with scale by a single camera. camera. And this is realized by, by actually doing also an estimation of the scale, uh, which is typically mission uh, missing, missing with a same camera. And, and it's, it's also very robust, robust against a different lighting condition. And uh, for example, also then what we're testing here is actually some strong wind. So the cable or the, the cord is uh, imitating wind. So you're tracking to take the air vehicle away and it automatically moves back to the initial position. Again, here we have no GPS involved, it's only vision, single camera looking downward and the IMU system which is on, on the system. So um, we could say probably, yes, it's solved. We can uh, do outdoor navigation, we can do inspection or whatever. But I think there's still a lot of things to do. Imagine that you would like to um, interfere in this situation. This is the, um, uh, the a parade in Zurich with millions of people here on the bridge. And so if uh, police has to go and see what's going on in a certain situation, you need systems which are inherently stable, which uh, consider the low risk for the environment and for the people in the environment. And I think for doing so, we still need a lot of different elements to be um, solved. One thing which I will not touch in this talk is regulations. So the question is, can we actually get uh, access or um, the, that we can fly? It's much easier with military, actually they just do it, I think, but um, in civil applications it's more difficult. 
There is a link with the consequence of failure, what happens if really a system fails. There is still the operation issue, I think, how can we have a user-friendly operation. Today, typically these systems are controlled by a team of people and not by one person and a team of skilled people. At one point, they should be uh, able to operate it without actually with uh, un untrained people. Then I think there's still a lot of, uh, about autonomy. One, flight duration. These uh, quarter-hour systems can fly probably something like 10, 15 minutes. Um, if the battery is getting better, probably you can reach 130 minutes, but there's still some limitation. I think you cannot fly very long. There is still this collision avoidance, I think, which is an important element, which to my view is not really solved. So the, you de need dense maps so in order to really find it, your way through the environment. You have robustness um, issues, which uh, I think is strongly linked also with uh, visual features. If you have good features, and I will come back on this, uh, you can be much more robust. Then localization and SLAM, the question is uh, what can, how can you handle uncertainties and even failure of sensors and how to integrate them, I will come back also on this. And then there is onboard calculation. We have limited calculation power, limited payload in the system, so you have to find ways how to um, come up with uh, onboard calculation because you never can rely 100% on, on wires, uh, wireless communication, so you need onboard um, systems. So let me start with uh, some flying concepts. Um, we actually worked with quite different flying concepts, starting with quarters, which are we are do not doing much anymore because this is really offered by, by skilled companies, a very nice quarter or multi-copter system. We are still working on, on solar airplanes. I will come back on this. Also blimps, I think, in some situation might be a very interesting approach. I will show one of our results. We will, I will not touch on the flapping wings. Most of you but probably have seen this um, uh, flapping wing concept from Festo, which is really extremely nice to look at. It's a complex system, but um, it has been proven that it can really fly in an indoor environment um, by flapping wings. And there is still, of course, an issue. Is it more reliable and more efficient than, uh, than um, uh, quadrotors, for example? I think there is nobody really has proven this exactly, but that might be an interesting concept because you can mix actually hovering with some sort of, of uh, gliding. So let me start first with our work on solar airplanes. This actually was initiated by the dream or vision to fly on Mars. Um, Mars is a very hostile environment and has a very low and density of the atmosphere, but uh, if you could fly, you could move much, flow, much more around on Mars. So we did start some investigation and some calculations. On one side, you have the, the mass which is required to fly for the structural mass, the batteries, and so on, the solar, uh, and then you have the aerodynamics condition, which um, actually generates the lift force. And so lift force and then the mass has to be in balance. If you do this and you try to optimize there is some interesting elements which come out um, that you, you have an optimization depends very much on the structural loading and, then, and that you have in some sense also the advantage if you are smaller, structural loading is less of an issue. So these airplanes, if they are small, they're probably even better uh, apart that the aerodynamics becomes a little worse. But by doing this optimization, we have been able to show in 2008 that we can fly for in continuous mode. You can see here Andre not uh, launching his uh, solar airplane. It was fl flying 27 hours and we were landed with full batteries so we could have continued. But of course it was in a sunny summer day and it cannot, this uh, system could not fly in, in, in uh, the clouds. So this uh, motivated us to go on, so at least to have airplanes which can fly, fixed wing airplanes for long duration. So one system is this one, the sensor, which is not intended to fly continuously, but which has additional sensors on it, like, for example, infrared camera. So the vision is there to fly very close to ground, so that you can more or less do what you can do typically with a quadrotor, but for a very long duration, up to about 10, 10 hours. The other dream is the Atlantic Solar, which we just recently started about a year ago, with the intention to fly over the Atlantic. This is a little bit bigger, it's about six, nearly six meters wingspan, and um, Hopefully we can show that with such an air vehicle, you have fixed wing air vehicle can fly really around the world at one point, at least starting with flying from Canada. And I see we have some people which can help us from starting from Canada to, to Lisbon. So this, we selected actually this route because this was already done with a fueled small air vehicle and hopefully we get permission, but still this is uh, one of the open issues. So a second element for 
having longer flight duration is uh, to have lighter than air air vehicles. And this is actually results from a student project, third year bachelor project, a team of students developed this blimp, which is actually a combination between a, a, a blimp and a quadrator, I tend to say, because we have four um, propellers um, arranged uh, around the system, which allows to have a system which is omnidirectional, which can fly in all directions immediately, can turn in all directions, and uh, can move really smoothly. And what is special about these type of, of uh, air vehicles, you can actually fly pretty close to people because it cannot automatically fall, it will always be lifted, so it, it's not an uh, not a inherent danger to the environment. And so this is another approach, I think, for, for um, having systems which are more reliable, less risky for the environment. Of course, there is some li limitation with wind. It can fly against winds f about 20 kilometers an hour, but then, of course, with high wind, you will actually use the batteries, and then you will also not have a long, very long flight time anymore. So, now I would like to go over a little bit to, to its navigation. And uh, of course, the first thing is typically localization. Localization is done in most places with uh, some sort of a um, common filter or, or a, a probabilistic based approach where you fuse different information. And very often, if you use camera and IMU, you fuse the camera images and IMU in a tight manner together which um, works pretty nicely as long as both systems give reliable results. But as soon as you have one system which has probably some failure for a certain time, or you have probably you want to integrate more different um, sensors which can really have very strongly contradictory results, the tight coupling is probably not the best solution. So what we are proposing is some sort of a, because it loosely coupled filter-based approach, where we have a pose estimation in some sort of a black box of each sensor. So this is then, for example, the camera, but it can also be the GPS, it can be a, a laser-based system, and we have the IMU, and we fuse them together, but you have always a failure detection involved in the whole thing. So you only fuse those signals which make sense, and you actually reject those signals which are not uh, making sense. And this is uh, demonstrated here as an example, here you have um, an integration of uh, vision and IMU uh, based uh, state estimation where you have um, here the different uh, directions and this is actually interesting what, what happens here. At one point the visual measurement fails. You can actually have a wrong association of features and all of a sudden it fails. Now if you can identify this, the uh, the um, IMU will help you to go get along for a certain while as, as long as, as the, the vision signal is not reliable and then you can actually get the vision signal back. And as you can see here, we have the visual measurement which actually has some problems in this uh, time period. We have the filter estimation in red and we have the ground truth in blue. And you can see that it really nicely consistent because we actually clean out or cancel out the vision integration at this time where uh, a failure of the vision system is detected. And I think this uh, on one side helps really to, to um, reduce or improve uh, reliability but also allows us to have different elements integrated without scaling the, the whole state space of the estimator enormously because you just have individual elements which you, you fit together. So it's also then much easier to add additional information you get into the system. A second element, what we are working on is at uh, continuous time e state estimation. Um, this is actually what, how we do it typically today. It's a, at a, some given time, you do an update of your estimate um, and uh, you assume that uh, in between you have no measurement and you, you linearize in between the different elements. Now, in a lot of situations, you have actually sensor systems uh, getting your information, update of information in a not very uh, precise, discrete uh, manner, but uh, whatever, in a random way. And this is, for example, the case, we will see the example later on, if you have a shutter camera, which is a line shutter camera, where each line comes in at a certain time and, and you add one line at the other. So if you assume that the whole picture is taken at the same moment, you are probably are pretty wrong with the system. So for improving this, you then should say, okay, we have a continuous time estimation and actually we integrate just all the information when it comes in at any time. And actually what you could also imagine, you can even 
integrate information which is actually be, uh, in the past, more in the past than the, your latest, latest update. This can happen because some sensors need much more time to actually extract and filter their information until it's ready than others, so they come in in a separate, separate timing. What of course you need is a very precise time stamping of the signals so that you can integrate it on one side and on the other side you need also a continuous form of the, the, the states. And this can easily be done in some sort of a, a B-spline for example or whatever function you would like to, to integrate to for this which is smooth function. So what, had, what can this do then for us? So we have here two um, uh, images where we have assumed here that you have a global shutter model and you are trying to track the corners here on the chessboard and here, here we have the rolling shutter model which is actually integrating the, the signals each time you have one line um, measured and with the correct uh, timing of the whole thing. It's a little bit difficult to see but you will see here on one side that if you have a global shutter model where you assume that at one point you have the whole image you will have a very blurry um, information about the corners if you have this rolling shutter model, which is this continuous integration of, on the update of the state, then you have a very nice tracking of the corners. So I hope you can see it. You can see more on this side and some elements, the, the green points are really getting out from the corners and on the other side, their re red points are pretty much always in the corner. I'm playing it again. And so, in principle, it's obvious. If you have a, line uh, a rolling shutter line camera, you will have a huge difference between the first and the last line. And if you assume that this whole picture is taken at the same moment, and if you have a fast movement, which is actually given by, uh, typically by uh, air vehicles, then you will have a problem. <coughs> so a second element, as I mentioned, I think to increase robustness, you need appropriate features. And um, we have, uh, started to develop a new feature which is called the brisk feature which is not too far from existing feature one but which is uh, mainly better that we have a, a, a better structured approach how to extract the features and describe the features so that they can be implemented much faster and can then really be running online uh, on board on a, on a flying robot. So again with most of the features we have the scaling effect so you have uh, different scales and then you have an interpolation about the scale about the scale, we are using the co fast corner detection um, and, uh, and then we have a structure which is given like this. So in principle you always have the, <coughs> the red circles which are the, the size of smoothing kernel up uh, where, uh, and then we have the blue circle which is the sample pixel and in compared with other approaches where you have randomly select uh, different uh, measurement points, here we have a very structured approach which allows us then to easily uh, handle the scale invariants and the rotation invariant. And uh, at the end you end up with something which is about 10 times faster than SURF, has, uh, but has about the same quality of uh, robustness against uh, lightning changes and against uh, different other issues. So um, again, still, even with this, it's quite tough to do it on a low power computer on, a, on board. So we are also in parallel also working on a, on a special card which has an FPGA involved so that we can do some part of the feature tracking on board directly. And here you can see actually on the video a little bit how reliable this, uh, this feature tracking works. You can see you can really turn in all directions and it, it easily tracks features. And this is working for indoor and outdoor Sometimes if you apply this, you, you are surprised, at least we are we're surprised and a lot of these features, um, actually not only the brisk feature, are pretty good on the grass. For us humans, grass is, is randomly the same and for actually cameras, they can actually track really nicely features on grass. We were just flying, putting our helicopter on grass, doing the visual, visual navigation and interestingly it worked extremely nicely, um, which would, uh, what human would really be lost. So, Technology has some other advantage uh, sensors and I think it's always important to really learn about this. We recently learned also that infrared cameras can extre be extremely nice and complementary to, to a standard camera. Imagine you have inside here, if you switch off the light, the infrared camera will more or less have exactly the same image. It will only smoothly change. For example, the light bulb will change the color, but this will take middle minutes and not seconds. If you switch off a standard camera, if it's dark, it's dark. 
And uh, this can be extremely helpful in, in a lot of situations, for example, for tracking features, because they don't change immediately and abruptly. So let me move a little bit towards, already towards the end. So what uh, with this combination with uh, a good estimator, which allows to integrate different sensors, but also um, the appropriate features, you can do to get today with uh, cameras quite a lot. And what, what you could also, can also imagine to add on not only one camera, but two cameras. And here we'll see the result. I hope the light is good enough of um, doing this uh, feature tracking and mapping with IMU and vision only, but with a stereo camera. And if you have a stereo camera, so it's moving around here, you can see actually here all the features which are tracked and then aligned in a map. And what we're doing here is, is moving more or less the size of this building, actually moving even from one building to the other, um, up and down different stairways. And you can see you have a pretty nice um, map of the end. It's not a consistent map, so we are not doing uh, uh, um, loop closing, but in principle you can easily add this once uh, you have uh, already a, a very precise um, arrangement of all the points. Now the stereo camera has one strong advantage compared with what we did up to now with a single camera is that um, Vistero can immediately have also dense information. Dense information is not required typically for, for localization and mapping, but it's required for collision avoidance. So if you want to fly into, into a building through a door, you need a dense information. You can actually forget it later on, but you need dense information. And by using camera, a stereo camera, using features for localization and then using the stereo image for actually collision avoidance, we hope that we can further improve that this system really become reliable in all type of environment without collision and you can fly them around and they, they know where they are. So one element always too with this dense map is only to show what you can imagine if you have a, um, different images and you typically stitch this image together. This can, you can have all this, this uh, goodies even on, on mobile and smartphones but it takes quite a, some calculation power, so you can do this not do in real time on a, a lower, low calculation power. But what you can imagine to do is that you track only features, the, the features, for example, BISC features, as you can see here, and you move around in the environment, and you use these features to align one image sample to the other. And so this tracking of the features can be done in real time, and then you can just stitch them together and you have somewhat a naive first approach um, for the whole, um, for consistent um, representation of the local environment. And of course, this can also be then done with, with stereo images. So you need, you use the, the, fi the features to realign one image to the, the other of the stereo images. And then you have immediately a very pretty consistent depth map of the local environment. <coughs> so with this, I would like to wrap up. I think long duration flights are possible if you go with other systems than with um, helicopters, for example, with fixed wing solar airplanes or blimps. This will actually extend the range, I think, for applications. I'm personally extremely convinced that the solar type airplanes uh, have a very high value because you'll launch them and then you can actually keep them and get information for hours. Imagine you have a bushfire, these uh, airplanes can give you update. After an earthquake, our, the Swiss earthquake uh, rescuing team mentioned that the biggest issue when they go to a place to help is that they arrive there and nobody knows anything about where is the critical issue. So it's best if they could themselves actually get a view of the situation. So launching an airplane would allow them really to get immediate information and then actually uh, have an update of the situation. And I think there is other fields like agriculture and so on which this can be of help. Um, Feature-based visual navigation for small air vehicles, I think, is uh, getting feasible today uh, with all the different elements, but there still is some, some additional improvement on hardware and, and software, algorithms uh, needed, but there is a high potential, and I think it's, it's the time to do it. And um, improved features and estimation techniques uh, will hopefully help to make these systems more reliable together also with hardware reliability. If it's a fixed wing airplane, for example, we have full redundancy. So each actuator actually can fail and we can still continue to fly. This is with the, this, the sensor system, not, not with all the system. 
but you can actually do redundancy so you can still have a safe landing once uh, one uh, propeller is failing or one um, actuator is, is failing. So with this, uh, I'm concluding and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much for your attention.